so first off, let me thank all of you uh, for coming here uh, to this to this panel. Um, I definitely want to thank all the fellow panelists uh, right now for, for being here. Um, my name is Talib Hudson. I am a field advisor with the group Violence Intervention here at the National Network for Safe Communities. Uh, my particular portfolio is in the, is in the Southeast, um, but uh, as some of you may know, I've gone to other cities where, where I may have seen uh, some of you in other places uh, as well. So this particular uh, session is on uh, the power of community action. And what I'd like to do, if this is okay with my, with my fellow uh, stage mates here, uh, uh, first I want to get a little bit into who everyone is uh, and give people space to, to do that um, and also give you a little bit of space to do that in a second. Um, we'll go into this idea of community in and of itself because that has come up, I think, in some of the previous panels uh, and sessions today and even yesterday. And then we're really going to get into action, which I think is what, what folks are, are, are here for. So I've got some notes that I typed out previously, and I have some notes on my phone. So if you see me looking down, I'm not on Twitter. I'm just trying to make sure that I have my thoughts together. But if you are on Twitter, hashtag NNSC at 10 so that we can make sure we get all your tweets collected. So first, let me just ask so we can get a sense of, of who we all are. How many people came to this session looking for new ideas and strategies to implement in their own community? Oh, okay, got a few. All right, how many of you just came out of curiosity about what community action is in any sense? Excellent, great. And how many of you just kind of realize that you're in the wrong room and you don't really know how to slide out without it? That's cool. Well, I'm, I'm glad you're here. If that's you, if you excuse yourself, I won't, I won't feel offended, but it's okay. How many people consider themselves part of a community-based organization or community-based activist of some degree? And how many of them, how many consider themselves somewhat of a, uh, maybe a social services agency? Okay, we have any uh, law enforcement, academia, are there any other general categories that, that were not mentioned? Yes, sir. Public housing developer. Public housing developer. Got you. On the, on the, on the public side or the, or the private side? On the private side. On the private side. Okay, excellent. Any other, that's a good point, any other, any other private sector folks in the room? Okay, all right. So, sounds like we have some community-based uh, organizations, some activists, social service providers, some law enforcement, public housing developer, thank you for coming. Uh, so that's kind of sounds like, so now we have a sense of you know, who we all are, we kind of have a sense of what we're here for. I will start by saying a little bit about myself so you know who, who I am and who is this person that has the microphone before you, and then I will get into uh, the folks um, before you um, as well. And what I, what I like to do is to have a conversation is that, is that cool with folks? So I, I know my, my, my good colleague, uh, my great colleague Jefferson, um, I believe has, who has the mic? Is that, is that he has the mic? So, um, and if there are not enough mics, it's fine. But we, we, we'll have like the conversation up here, but I also wanna make sure that if there's, if there's something that sparks something, um, people have the opportunity to, to join in on the conversation. Um, just as long as you know, this, as long as you understand, it's not your conversation. Can we can we can we can we be in agreement on that? Yes. Okay. Great. Because no one came here to see hear a speech. Cool. So just so you let, to let you know who I am, uh, very briefly, as I said, um, my name is Telly Hudson. I'm a field advisor uh, with the National Network. Uh, I come to this work. Um, I'm a, a a child of Harlem, New York City. Uh, raised in Harlem during the, the, the crack epidemic and wanting to make a difference um, in, my, in my community. Um, I have done community-based activism 
um, and outreach around gun and gang violence, street corner resources, which is a small community-based organization here in Harlem. I've worked at the Manhattan District Attorney's Office in the Community Partnerships Unit, um, where I moderated similar forums to some of the call-ins that you uh, may have seen, as well as worked on violence prevention and building the relationships between law enforcement and community. Um, and then also, uh, in, my, in my spare time, um, I'm getting my PhD in public policy at uh, the new school where I'm studying community-based interventions to, to street violence. So those are the, the lenses and the, and the frame through which I come to this work and, and, and where I see things. So that's, that's kind of who I am. And now I, want, I just want to turn it over to, to the folks who you know, we have before us today. Again, thank you for coming out. Take just a, a, a moment, if you will, and talk about or let us know who are you. And when I say who are you, I don't just mean what is your name and title, but who are you? You know, what do you bring to this work? Why are you here? Um, what drives you? And, and why are you here at this panel at this moment right now? And I'll start with uh, my sister Donna Hall to the, to the left. Hello. <clears throat> my name is Donna Hall. I'm a postal worker over 20 years. I'm a mother. I'm a grandmother. I'm just a normal, average person. I was brought into this. I lost my son in 2013. I have always been a speaker. They say I talk too much because I'm always talking to the people in the neighborhood, but this is, this is who I am. I have to, I'm saving my boys. I lost my baby, but my other boys are out there. And that's who I am. I'm just a normal, average mom and grandma. My name is Daryl Harris. I am the 11th child out of 12 to Dorothy May Harris and Pastor C.L. Keys. I am a broken reed in the wind. I am a amalgamation of sorrow, pain, and joy, and hope. And I am a force to stand for those who are not able to stand for themselves. And that's who I am. I'm Norm, can you hear me in the back, Louisa? So I'm one that normally doesn't use a microphone. Stacy. Stacy. Okay. I find these uncomfortable. But my name is Stacy R. Spell. I am first and foremost a husband, a father, a grandfather, uncle. I am a social change agent. I am an activist. I'm someone uh, as fierce as a lion and as loving as a teddy bear. <laughs> I, uh, I, I am a peacekeeper. I'm someone who believes in building peace. I'm a child of the 60s who believes in transformative change in my community. I'm a person that speaks for a community that is diverse, but is sometimes apathetic. I'm a retired homicide detective from the city of New Haven, now running Project Longevity New Haven as the program manager. I'm someone who wants to change the world. Uh, the key words that I live by is that practice a random acts of kindness and senseless acts of beauty. I want my living to be my, my eulogy, and I want to make sure that I leave the world better for my grandchildren and for those that are around me. My name is Paul Soglin. I was uh, born and raised in the city of Chicago. Uh, those of you who know the city, I grew up and went to uh, Hyde Park High School. I uh, attended the University of Wisconsin in the early 60s. Uh, got involved in open housing and the civil rights movement. Uh, participated in a program with Dr. King in 1965. Got active in the civil right, uh, the, the anti-war movement. Uh, was arrested by the Madison Police Department three times. Uh, beaten only once. Uh, when I was in law school, I decided to run for mayor. I was elected mayor in 1973, and I'm a case of recidivism. I left the office, went back, did it again, left the office, went back and did it again, and uh, was retired by the public two months ago. 
So here we are. Yeah, we, we can use we can use both. My, oh, there's another mic. Yeah, give yeah. them those two. Okay, yeah, sounds good. So, power of community action. And, and when I first looked at the description and looked at the title, did this work? Oh, thank you. So when I first looked at the description and looked at the title, I was like, okay, let's get into those strategies. Let's get into those innovations it speaks about in the description. But then earlier today, there was this question of. When we say community, what are we even talking about? So when I was growing up, the community, we're talking about people who lived in Harlem, right? People who were mostly black and brown folk. Uh, and working with law enforcement, the community could be people who are private business owners. It, it, it might be inclusive of, of law enforcement and uh, uh, public institutions. So before we even talk about what community action is, what is community and what are we even talking about? Go here. I think that um, when you talk about, I think community is all of that. I think community is something that includes neighborhood, which encompasses territory or a certain amount of territory. I think it encompasses a particular mindset or orientation that also goes along with it. I think that one of the questions you started with and just asking uh, to the persons who are out in the audience, we're a community right here. We've been a community for the last couple of days. We spent time together, we've networked together, we've come to understand that even though our philosophies may be a little bit different, but our methodologies may be a little bit different, but our goal and our aim is pretty much the same. And I think that that is what community is. I think it is a resource bucket of people with different ideas and different philosophies, different beliefs and different methods coming together and working together with one constituency. And I think that that's why it's so confusing to talk about it because I think that this country has lost that sense for a while and I think we're trying to find our way back. Stacey, can you pick this up? Because you're someone who's worked in a multitude of sectors yourself. So for me, community, encompasses not only those that live in the community, but those that work in the community. You might travel to my community and let's say there's a hospital and you spend 12 to 16 hours a day as part of that community. You're part of the economic development. You are part of all the things that speak to community. It's also those that come to play in our community. For me, I'm a gardener. I oversee community gardens. I oversee community spaces, green spaces. For me, it's a way of bringing peace, transforming where violence might have been, and paving that violence, putting beauty where people don't expect beauty. So those gardeners that come in to work with me in the community green spaces, in the community gardens, they're part of my community. They're helping me to make a change. They're modeling behaviors that we want others to take on. There are people that will come into some of the drives, not only in my community, but in the communities that I try to empower, where we do community cleanups. Those organizations that take part in those community cleanups, they're part of that, that community. We're modeling the behavior that we want others to assimilate. We want them to see those same behaviors, and though they might not join us in the cleanup, but it's a wonderful thing to see on the way back that house that we passed now has somebody out there with a broom or with a rake. So it's all those that live, work, and play in our communities that make our communities what they are. So then, who then, you spoke about the community cleanup, right? And you're saying that some folks may not necessarily join in. So is it that, are there folks who may not, and I wanna make sure I'm hearing you correctly, live in a specific geographic community, but maybe part of a larger, different community that, that is engaging in this? And if so, then what is the sense of responsibility? What is the onus on the people who live in that, that area? And anybody could just hop in at any point they want to. Do you have, do you have the other mic? Is it good? Okay, yeah. I think, again, I think that there, that's why I said that it's a wide swath. I think there's a sense of community that we use that really talks about humanity. And that's that broader context, right? All of us are a part of that. Whether you live in a geographical space or not, 
you're a part of the human context of community. That's what makes us different than the animals or the bears or the tigers, right? Oh my, right? Um, but I also think that there is a particular uh, neighborhood, if you will, geographical type of community as well. And going to the first part of that that you somewhat opened the door to, yes, even those persons who may not be a part of the operation of our philosophy of moving forward, whatever we may think that is, picking up a rake or being responsible for cleaning up, even for those who may be committing a crime, until we begin to see them as a part of our community, we're not going to be empathic toward them. We're going to think that they are not a part of our community, and that's why we treat them like we do. Even if they're not doing the part of what we would like them to do, we have to still recognize that's Mama Mamie's boy. You know, that's, that's Sister Annabelle's boy. That's, that's Uncle Leroy's boy. And until we can do that, we're going to just be looking at them as, well, you're not a part of our community because you're doing this. And then that's when law enforcement and other agencies begin to come in and pick up that slack. And now we're beginning to feel what that really feels like because we lose that person, even though they may not have been a part of our philosophical construct, we lose that person as a valued asset to the community because at the end of the day, that's still Mama Mamie's boy. That's still Auntie Annabelle's boy. So now what are we going to do? And I think that just to your point, um, yes, there's the two concepts to that. There's the humanity part of, of community, and then there is that geographical part of community. And we got to see everybody. Community is taking the good and the bad. It's like a body. Your body is good. And then there are times you catch a cold or something and it's bad. You don't just throw away your body because it catches a cold. You do what you need to do to try to heal it because you recognize it as one body. Just because your hand hurts, you don't cut your hand off and say, well, it's not part of my body anymore. You do what you need to do to fix it because it's a part of your body. And I think that's what communities are. Gotcha. You okay. just changed the definition of community and I think changed it for the better. Normally, communities defined with a group of people coming together with a common interest, wanting to make either a place or an idea better. And if you think about it, how someone might be approached in a community where you might say to them, you are not part of this community. You are not contributing. And that's the crux of what you're saying. And we've got to recognize that everyone who shares that space, shares that idea, is part of the community. So then, Don, if you could pick up on this point then, because I remember you gave a sneak preview at yesterday's session about the sisterhood. And you didn't want to go too much into the details because you know, you're going to be here today. But my understanding is that, you know, that there, you know, that they were, part of the, the community that now you have been able to create, right, was born out of um, a situation. Uh, and so how does this strike you now as someone who has created an actual defined community known as the sisterhood? How, how, is, how is this resonating with you? And maybe even talk about what the sisterhood is for those, of the, those who don't know. Well, the sisterhood, we are actually about 75 mothers now. We started off, with, it was six of us. and. Um, I'm one of the co-founders. We went to an event. Uh, it was like a potluck for moms who lost their kids, and we were actually just sitting in the group, and we really didn't get anything out of it, you know, sitting there depressed and eating and crying, and we could have did that at home. So me and another lady, we suggested let's start our own organization, and because one of the ladies, she knew a lady that uh, overseed, um, uh, what you call it? She had other facilities. She used to run a... Like a boys and girls club or something okay. like that, you know, a youth center. And so we took it to her, and she's our president. And what we do in the community, our com well, I'm from the west side, majority of them from the south side. So in what we do, she's the first responder also. She works for Mount Sinai Hospital. So when she get a call, it's been a, uh, somebody's been deceased, they got shot or whatever, she immediately get that call, and she go, and she meets the mom. And she'll call me, or if the mother, if it happened on the west side, she'll call me, and I would text the mom that night, and I'd tell her who, a little bit of who I am and what I do, and I'd tell her I'd give you a call back in a couple of days, you know, because I know when it first happened, everybody all over the place. And 
couple of days I, I text her and ask her, can I call her? And she, you know, give me a number, whatever. Because we go through Facebook, you know, if I don't have the number. And basically what we do, we connect with that mom because if you never lost a child, you would never know the experience. It's been six years for me, but it's like yesterday. I still see it as yesterday. So and what uh, I went to an event with another mom, a call in, and she was like, I was angry. I hated, I hated everything and everybody around me. I'm not going to lie. I'm a normal, I'm an average person. I, I hated everybody. I even hated myself. I was suicidal. And I moved away for two years. My whole family, we just packed up and moved away. I was going to counseling. I was going to therapy. I was suicidal. But it wasn't working because everybody on the panel, they kids committed suicide. So that wasn't, that wasn't helping me. And so I moved back to Chicago, and I met a lady named Maria, and she invited me to a call-in. And she was telling me what it was and sitting down talking to the guys, and I'm sitting there like, one of these MFs probably killed my son, so why is she bringing me here? And then I heard from everybody, and then I started thinking, I can't, I'm raising my granddaughter. I can't teach her love if I'm still hating. Mm. So, of course, the detectives, I still don't know who killed my son. I called the detectives, got no answer, whatever. So I gave up on that. So I start praying, and that day I was going to take my life. I, could, I remember what day it was, the date, everything, the time, and my grandbaby called. Mommy, what you doing? And I said, let me call you back. And I just dropped to my knees, and I said, God, just give me one more day. And that's my prayer, just give me one more day. And I said, somebody need me. She needs me because I'm actually raising her now. And she didn't call me about 10 times while I was here. <laughs> so, but the community, a lot of guys... My son was known. He wasn't the perfect child, but he was my child. And the guys in the community, they called me Mama Donna. And I talked to them, and they, I see them on Facebook. They calls me, and I'm, I'm, I'm ministering to them. I'm talking to them. Ma, I need a job. I need this. I need that. I got here Monday. One of the guys called me. He's, he was sounding depressed. What's wrong, son? Man, Ma, they finna do this. Okay, well... I ain't got no money, I'm finna go to New York. I said, okay, I gave him my cable bill. I know my cable gonna be cut off when I get back home. But I said, that's okay. It's like, I have to do this. I have to, I'm just so, Deb, I know she get tired of me. Deb, when are we doing another call in? You know, and some of the guys that I have met, I have been to their wedding. They got married, they call me Mama Donna, their kids call me Grandma. So I know it worked. I had the baby mamas to call me. Uh, you don't know me, Miss Hall, but my, my, my guy told me about you. And I'm like, I'm doing something right. I'm saving somebody else's son. And that, that is my compassion. I'm, I'm just so into this. And when I get back home, I called the president. I said, girl, we got a lot of work to do. I said, we, man, we got, I done met so many people. We got a network. And I'm just so into this. And my son is not coming back. I, he's not coming back. It's not a day that don't, that don't pass. I don't think about him. I had him cremated. So he's with me always, every day. He's not coming back. But it's somebody else's son out there that need me. And if I can help another mother to not go through the pain that I'm going through, it's worth it. And that's why the community, we have to get involved. And I was speaking to Paul, and I was like, the community, I want to sit at the, one of your police board, one of your meetings, because... You can't tell me what my neighborhood need if you've never been in my neighborhood. So I have to be there just to listen. Maybe I can have some ideas and I can tell you what Lil Ray Ray need. Lil Ray Ray talk to me, he's not gonna talk to you because you come in our neighborhood and you talking to him like he's nothing. They're not bad kids, I don't care. They're not bad kids, they just misguided. And so the work that you're talking about, right, you, what I'm hearing is you are, are counseling other mothers, right, who have gone through similar uh, tragic situations. You are counseling uh, young people who are involved in, in the street life, as it were. You're participating in the GVI ceasefire call-ins as well. But you're also a, 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 a mail carrier. So is this, is, this, is, this some, is this a labor of love? Is this your full-time job? How, did, how is this working for you? No, this, I work for the post office. I'm a, a city carrier. I've been doing that 27 years. But when Deb called 
or Paul call, or we got a call in. Okay, let me rearrange my schedule. Let me switch my off days. Okay. And or, so, but this is this not my full time job. Right. I don't get paid for it, so I don't consider it a job. It's I consider this is what I have to do because these are my kids. Mm. So. And were you doing this before? My, be, be, no. Before the before the, the before Deb called you or? No. Okay. No, actually. The first time I did it, my son was murdered January the 18th, 2013. And uh, I say two months, two months after my son was murdered. Uh, what's his name? Oh, Chris. Chris, Chris Millett. Because I was my block club president. Okay. I used to go to my block club meetings. So you were already involved in the I engaged. was already involved mm -hmm. in the community. Mm -hmm. So the CAPS uh, guy and Chris, I met them and, cause I actually, what happened was, I, when my son got killed two days later, I sent the email to the CAPS guy and to uh, our uh, commander. And I said, my name is Donna Hall and this is my address. I go to the uh, CAPS meet. My son was killed on our block. Nobody reached out to me. Not that I wanted anything from y'all. Y'all didn't reach out to me to offer my, your condolences. Mm -hmm. And I'm at that CAPS meeting every day. The next day, they were at my house, and they apologized. They said, you're right. You're part of the community. Mm. I said, it's not that I want something from y'all. Y'all have to get to know these kids in your neighborhood. Not all of them are bad. Mm. So that's actually how it started. Sounds like uh, Paul Smith, my, my predecessor and mentor, mentioned something about communities and uh, police responding to victims of violence, CPRVV, which is now part of the, of the GVI ceasefire model. So I want, I want to pick up on what on what you were just talking about in terms of doing this work and I want to ask you Bishop and then Stacy and, and Miriam coming to y'all next um, is this is this your what you do 24 7 is this is this is this your job is this, I know you have the mic in your hand so feel free to respond to everything else she, she said before but um but I'm just I'm just wondering you know what is the work that that you're doing in case people don't know they may know that you speak at call-ins or whatever what is the work that what is the work you were doing before you know the GVI the ceasefire came um and uh, and, and how does it relate now well 60 seconds on this first, go ahead take because it. I think that what you said is so important this is because I didn't recognize I think you helped me today because I realized that's one of the reasons that I have so many struggles is because I kind of redefine things. <laughs> um, and you helped me to realize that today. So thank you uh, for doing that because it didn't seem like a redefinition to me but because that's just the way, that's how mama raised us. You know, it, it, my mom took in people off the streets. You know, it was already 12 of us. This, any day I could be sharing my room with three other people that I had no clue who they were. Right, because my mom just said that. And so I just think you exemplify exactly what I'm talking about, community. And when you expose what happened to you, you were hurt because your community, that geographical area that you had been in support, shared the same ideology because something happened to your son that they didn't understand. You were kind of done like this. And that hurts because you are still a part of that community. Does your son deserve any less respect because he was murdered. Do you deserve any less respect because of what happened to your son? Absolutely not. And so it's just impressing on me to just make sure to say that the quality of transformational thinking and, and acting has to be a part of our community definition. Because if it's not, then we get to write certain people off that we don't agree with in our communities. And that's what's making the problem today. So now I can answer the other question. <laughs> So before this, um, I've been a pastor now for, uh, this is my 33rd year of being a pastor. Thank all of you uh, for saying, you don't even look that old. I appreciate it. Um, <laughs> I appreciate it. Uh, and um, so I have literally on the back of, uh, my baby brother was killed. A uh, young man after he got out of school decided that I uh, wanted to play Russian roulette, trying to impress some girls. My brother said that he didn't want to play. The guy uh, had a 38 revolver. He spent the uh, will, put it to my brother's head while my brother's back was turned, pulled the trigger thinking it would be a joke, and it actually went off, uh, killing my brother. 
Two days later, after that, while I'm trying to help my mom plan for the funeral, I get a call that uh, my wife has been brutally attacked and raped in her home, in our home. Uh, we were just about newlyweds back then. And uh, I mean, I just got a story, a history of this, that, or the other. But it's, you know, I believe that those are the types of events, just as you mentioned, that cause you to make a decision on what you're going to do with your life and how you're going to respond. Uh, what you're going to do with your energy. Are you going to go and become what it is that you are angry at, or are you going to do something with that anger to be more restorative and constructive? And I decided to spend my life in that manner. So human rights commissioner, I became for the city of Detroit. I started working with Ceasefire after that, uh, and then just became a national speaker as it related to victims. Um, and victimization across the country. And those are the types of things that, that I've been doing. And so, Stacy, I saw you give the, the Tiger Woods, Michael Jordan fist pump. What's, what, what's, what's going on there? The bishop hit the nail on the head, you know. We see, especially in communities of color, we see a lot of anger and frustration. And we see a lot of finger pointing. But one of the key factors that I point out, that when you point one finger at someone, you got three more pointing back at you. What are you doing to be part of the solution? Don't just tear down. What are you doing to build up? Whether you are a Jew, Muslim, Sikh, Christian, all of us have tenants where we are supposed to take care of our brothers. Your walk is supposed to match your talk, and your talk is supposed to match your walk. Other than that, it's just empty rhetoric. Get away from it. So for me, it, it wasn't. You know, I spent 27 and a half years as a policeman, three years of it in the military as a policeman. I hadn't planned to leave the police department when I did, but there were some things going on that it was better that I left when I did because uh, I told my father, I said, Dad, you're going to have to come and get me. You're going to have to come. He says, oh, boy, I'll come and pick you up anytime." He says, no, Dad, no, no. I'm going to be coming out of the other door. You can't be 50 years old and fighting on the job. So I left. And when I left, I did not get a job. I ran a nonprofit. And it happened to be in the area that I lived. And the area that I lived, I came to that area as a result of when you were a New Haven police officer, you had to live in the city of New Haven. So the same house that I moved in to become a cop, 40 years later, I'm still there. And I watched my neighborhood go through a cycle of violence of economic decline, of old timers dying off and their children not wanting to live in the community, and we were beset by violence. And I had lost two nephews, a number of young cousins, I'm still use, losing young, cous uh, young cousins who are still out there doing dirt. And I wanted to make a change in my neighborhood. I was, I was fed up. I couldn't stand for another body to drop and we were, they were dropping left and right. We were having broad daylight shootouts, ramp, rampant drug dealing, prostitution going on the same corner where kids were waiting for the bus for school. I said, enough's enough. And even though I wasn't a policeman, I still lived here. That's my hood. And I approached some brothers as big as me, some bigger. I said, I need you to stand with me in our commercial district. I said, Stacy, we can't stand with you, man. That's, that's not me. So I started standing by myself. And in standing by myself, all it takes is one person to incite something. Have you noticed in a riot, it's, all it takes is one person to say, yeah, let's go turn over that car, Paul, and let's go break out those windows. And all it takes is one person to do it, and everybody will follow. So I started working at Violence Resilience, start trying to build resiliency in communities of especially in my community of color, where utilizing the formula that communities naturally come together in the aftermath of a natural disaster. Whether it's a snowstorm, you go out and you help your neighbors, right? It's a flood. It's a hurricane. We have a natural tendency as humans to come together and help one another. But in violence, it's a different story. I'm, an, I'm older, proud of a 64. And I come from an era where you lost someone. People came to your house and said, oh, do, I, do you need me to do
do anything. People brought food, they brought water, they brought meals. You didn't have to cook. But it was a community that shored up, that edified one another. So I was looking to edify my community. And all I, I, you'll consistently hear me say, modeling the behavior I want others to assimilate. Modeling the behaviors that I want others to take on. If they see me consistently, every week, picking up papers, picking up garbage, guess what? People are going to emulate that. If they see me planting flowers and engaging, and I'm, I'm of southern roots, so I speak to everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. And if you don't speak, you're rude. But going back to building relationships, and that's what it's all about. Resetting the calibers, uh, calibers for, in our communities of speaking to one another, creating civility. You do not have to like me. But hey, you live two doors down from me. I see you walking to the car. If you can look me in my eyes, you can make eye contact with me walking down the street. Good morning. How you doing, brother? How you doing, sister? Yeah. It's about creating those relationships. And when, you, when we know one another, we look out for one another. And from my galvanizing mission in life is rebooting how those of us in communities of color have for too long been apathetic, watch Pookie and Ray Ray, because we know that's Bishop so-and-so's grand boy, or, or that's so-and-so's son, that's so-and-so's daughter. But we don't school them, we don't approach them in love. I walk in love every day. I'm a strong man of faith. And I, I have no problem saying, hey, young sister, beautiful woman like you, you don't have no business doing all that cursing. A, woman, a pretty lady does not curse. Come on, you're too intelligent. And love, and guess what? They receive it. It's about resetting the relationships. It's about resetting how we look at one another. It's especially resetting that we in the community are the cavalry. We cannot wait for the cavalry to come to our community. So, because if we wait for City Hall or for the government to come, guess what? The cavalry ain't going to be there. We are the cavalry. Mm -hmm. We have to do these things. We have to pick up trash. We have to model the behavior. And we have to especially address the violence that goes on in our midst. So it, it sounds like it reminds me of uh, Pastor Garland Scott in the, in the morning session mentioned about putting the neighbor back in the hood. Uh, and so that's and what I what I think I might be hearing in terms of the power of community action. A lot of it seems to be about the actual interpersonal relationship building, whether it's building with other mothers and other uh, other uh, other other mother sons, whether it's building with uh, people in the in the community through your the faith network, but there's a building with folks in in the community that you see every day. So before I come to the, to the mayor, you know, so, so Donna, you were already involved in your community to some extent, and you got involved with the, the ceasefire group violence intervention model, um, speaking about your situation, and, and Bishop, I know you're involved, and I believe in the support and outreach component as well, and Stacy, you're, you're the, uh, the project manager, right, for Project Longevity in, in, in New Haven. So all of you are, have some, some piece of the, the GVI ceasefire model, and, and we're doing community work before then, so now I want to I want to turn to to Mayor Soglin and hear from from you um, as someone who is not necessarily doing the the GVI model or ceasefire, but we're talking about right the conversations about the emerging science and practice of violence prevention. And you showed me a pretty uh, interesting chart uh, yesterday afternoon. And so can you talk about that? And of course, feel free to riff on anything anyone sure. else has said. So so let me let me frame this. Uh, Madison is population of 255,000 people. From uh, April, I believe it was, of 2016 through August of 2017, which is a 17-month period, we had 14 homicides involving young African Americans on one side of the gun, if not both. Since uh, September of 2017, which is about 18, 19 months through this month, we've had four such homicides. We've not had a single homicide of any kind since last October. Now, we're, 
we're, we're in the third year of our funding. And uh, we are funding the Focused Interruption Coalition. And that was my job. I'm no longer doing community work. I wanted to make a change. I wanted to control things from the side of government. And so what I want to describe is the pain, the hypocrisy, and what's come up in several of the other sessions, which is who's getting paid to do this? Because my feeling is that the people who are doing this work are professionals. They ought to be paid, they ought to be respected, and their contribution to the community is, is immeasurable. Our city council is made up of 20 people. Almost everybody in Madison thinks they're a member of the city council, and most of them are. Every single one except one is somewhere between a liberal Democrat and a democratic socialist. Everybody claims to embrace social equity, the challenges of diversity, of disparity, the need uh, to bring about radical change. That's the game they talk. So, the first year we went to fund the program, it was at $200,000. And a lot of the money I wanted to put in got cut out. Now this last year, it's $400,000. I'd actually asked for something closer to a million. So what's going on here? Well, I'm gonna be in part repeating what's been said earlier today. First of all, there is the network of professional nonprofits. The folks who've been around for years, and as somebody said yesterday, maybe there's certain people who should not be at the table. These are the folks who know how to do the accounting, who know how to do all the IRS regulations and all of that. Our focused interruption coalition people don't know that. The leader, Anthony Cooper, who's just one of the most amazing people I've ever met, spent 20 years in prison for a murder and is just so marvelous working with younger men and women in the community, your community, and they had to find, they had to find a fiscal agent because by law, since they weren't a 501c3, they couldn't get the money. So these are the kinds of real things that we have to do. In the meantime, all of these, these other folks on our city council, they have political support from all of the folks who know the system, who have the 501c3s, who have the accountants, and all the rest of that. And so that's one of the real challenges. And in terms of, of government, government has got to change the way it distributes these funds and we have to bring the philanthropic community with because the philanthropic, com philanthropic community makes the same mistakes. They're looking for the people who in effect can guarantee them there will be no problems. When the Focused Interruption Coalition came along and, 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 and presented their program for funding, we had a staff meeting. One of the most important people on all this is uh, the deputy mayor for, for public safety in my office, Gloria Reyes. Gloria spent 13 years in the police department and wanted to do more. So Gloria and I and some of the staff sit down. One of the things we've got is information that there's members of the Focused Interruption Coalition. We're not so sure that they have severed all of their ties to the past. You know, well, Mr. Mayor, you know, there could be embarrassment here. The hell with that. That is part of the territory. If you want to participate in making these changes, you have to be prepared, just as one of your city staff or one of your council members may one day get arrested for, for a bribe. 
And if this kind of change in mentality is not made, first, that we cannot look for organizations that meet and cross every T and dot every I. If we're not going to change that, and if we're not going to change and recognize that, 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 that the people who are doing the best work do not have to be better than everyone else we contract with, we're not going to get anywhere. Uh, the only other thing I want to say in conclusion is we've done a lot of work with Cities United. I don't know if there's any folks here who've worked with Cities United, but I really hope that the work that's being done here by the network hooks up with Cities United and we get a unified force in this country because this is what's happening and this is really successful. It's got to be replicated. When I say replicated, the concept. But you cannot replicate this in one city or another. Part of its success is the people who are doing the work have to create the program. It is not going to be some outsider. They can come in and give advice. And I also want to final, uh, one more point I want to make. Go on. We've changed some of our city staff. They are still attached to their departments, but they are part of what we call our neighborhood resource teams. Resource. They are not there to run the neighborhood. They are there to be a resource. And you've got some of the usual suspects, the fire department, the police department, the housing specialists, the librarians. But it also includes our IT people and our bus drivers. There's nobody who goes through a neighborhood every day more than the police than the bus drivers. And the last thing I want to say is something about housing, since we've got a housing specialist here. If I could create a new program in this country, it would be a program on housing management. Because housing management is more than the leaky faucet collecting the rent and making sure that there's no litter in the yard. Wow. Housing management is working with the families, making sure that they do not have successive repetition in terms of eviction, in, in terms of the consequences of mispayment of the rent and, and all that comes, comes with it. And again, whether it's the housing specialists or it's our city staff, being a resource, you're not in charge. So, so, so really quick, in, in maybe 20 seconds or, or less, because there's a follow-up coming, who, you mentioned your, the, 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 the coalition. Who is on the coalition? And when you're talking about some folks have not let go of their, their past, can you, can you paint a picture more so for folks in the room who may not know what you're talking about? So the, 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 the Focus Interruption Coalition the best uh, skill set that most of them came with was already, already working on reentry and working with ex-offenders. So they, they had that skill set. So they were joined, uh, Gloria and about a dozen people met for six months and the, they included folks from the district attorney's office, they included folks from uh, a Madison Urban Ministry, uh, which was also doing outreach work, um, and, and they just formulated the, the program. But in the Focused Interruption Coalition itself, which was about a dozen people, um, we were six months into their funding and one of them got picked up on a probation hold and was, was back in prison. Um, and, and, and so this is, it's... So, so, then, so then the question is, because this question of funding has come up a lot, right, throughout the conference, and it's something that, that is, is talked about a lot. And you said, you know, you have to have the right people. But then the question is, who are the right people and how do you know, right? So just going on this panel alone, we have a range of perspectives, right? You know, Donna, you're saying this is not even like your job. This is just how you, you, you how your passion, right? This is what drives you. You know, Bishop, you know, you've been in, in ministry for some time, and it's another form of your ministry. And Stacy, you've been... A, you've been in law enforcement, and now um, you're, you're working in community activism. And in the cities, a lot of the cities that we work with, from of various sizes, 
people often say, you know, we'd love to have uh, a great community leader, but they're not here. They don't exist. So how do you find the right people, one, and then two, if you get the funding, how do you prevent them from being co-opted and still making sure it's a community program that we, you know, the definition of community we were talking about earlier? Anybody, hey, I want to keep it spicy, first, keep it first, funky, jump first in. Of, first of all, first of all, there is so much just to say behind everything. I, it's not been that clearly defined and spoken as you just did. And I want the first thing that I want to make sure that I say, and I say this with no disrespect, I want to say to all persons who are not of color, not black and brown, I want to say to you that this is what it's going to take from all of us. It's not when you talk to an African American, you talk to someone black, it's not necessarily that they're angry at you. They're angry at the way that things have been done. And sometimes, unfortunately, it comes out at you. But please understand, we know that we need your assistance, not your help. Mm -hmm. Let me define the difference mm -hmm. between the two. Please, please do. Help is what you refer to, Samir, when you said, if we're going to bring our resources, then we're going to bring our plan, and we're going to bring our people, and then we're going to come in and tell you how you need best to fix your community. Help is not what we need. We need assistance. You want that we would trust your organizations and your agencies, we need a little trust too. If you want to give us the assistance and say, look, we'll put in the resources and we'll give you an accountant, somebody that'll help you to make sure that your books are straight. And we'll put in this person to help you define you, it's your ideas, but they've gone to school for this. They'll help you put it on paper and strategize it so that you'll know how to do it and how to make it look and how to make it sound. That's fine. And that is what I am so applauding Mr. Kennedy for. It's not in the room right now, but bringing this together, this is a community. And even in this community, I've noticed, can I just be honest? Be honest. Even in this community, there's some separations going on. And how are we going to get out there and fix other communities out there if we can't even be, those of us that are working as a community or working in communities, we can't even get it right here. We got to get it right here so that we have something else to go, something to go out there and take that doesn't sound like everything else. And when you talk about the right person, mm -hmm. I think the one common trait that goes across this stage is the passion to really help my neighbor. That's it. It's not a bachelor's degree, it's not a master's degree, it's not a PhD, it's not I've been in this for so many years, because that's part of the problem. That's how we get the same person in these positions with different names. They're the same people, and that's how that happens, because we're not looking at the passion per se. When you look at filling out, writing a proposal to get a grant, what does happen to you? There's some of the things that's in that criteria, they ask how long has your organization been around? Automatically, that means new organizations with new ideas don't get an opportunity to come in. They've got to partner with or succumb to an organization that's been around for 30 years, probably doing nothing, or doing something that worked 30 years ago, but it doesn't work right now. You got all kinds of criteria in that stuff, and I think it starts where he mentioned, we've just got to, if we're really going to do it, we've got to give ownership back to and that's the resistance that you're getting in our communities you're getting the resistance because we're not owning anything and anyone even a public housing person will tell you a properties person will tell you that areas and neighborhoods that experience the most violence and that experiences the most uh upheaval are neighborhoods where there are more renters than owners mm -hmm. it's not brain surgery so we have to have the same kind of ownership, not only over our house, but over who's teaching in our schools and, and who's working on the police department. Yeah, we need to know this stuff because it impacts us the most. So, so Bishop, I want to ask, and this is not just for you, this is for, for anyone, and we're, we're going to be running low on time soon. So if anyone has any questions, let them start to, to, to germinate and we'll percolate those to the surface. 
you mentioned, you know, you said those who are not maybe African American, maybe those are not black or brown, so to speak, um, you know, it's anger is not directed at them, it's anger at how things have been done, you know, and, and what I want to kind of tease out here is because, again, the notion of community, right, and who is in the community, I mean, let's, let's keep it, let's keep it funky, right, in, in, you know, in a lot of the cities where the group violence intervention specifically is, is in predominantly black and brown communities, right? Why is it important for the community, and I'm speaking specifically about the people of color that, that you just mentioned, why is it even important for those folks to be driving the solutions as opposed to be just incorporated in the solution? Because anyone would tell you that the best solution to any problem is hidden in the problem. When you go to diagnose what's going on in a person's, you know, with the, with the cancer or something like that, you don't go and find another body. <laughs> you don't go out and get some other body and examine that body and then come back and say, oh, I've got the solution to your cold. I've got the medicine to your cold. You've got to come, you've got to come to my body. And you have to allow the elements of my body to be a part of my own healing. That's just the way that God set it up. And, and I, I see Stacey. Can I just quickly to... add yeah, one yeah. thing there? The, the old community organizer, Saul Alinsky, used to say, never do something for someone that they can do for themselves. And the reason for it is not just the paternalistic attitude of doing it for someone else, but if you do it for them, you are taking away their educational learning and growing process. You are stifling them. Okay, so he just mentioned someone important. Saul Alinsky, Rules for Radicals. If you've never read it, read it. I'm going to be the radical in the room. We are in a crisis in black and brown communities. And if we continually wait on the dollar, guess what? We will just be just that waiting. And being in that crisis, it is imperative, whether you are a Q, whether you are an Alpha, whether you are a Delta, whether you are Mason, or Elk, whatever the organization, if you care about where you live, galvanize. Put them brothers together. Be the head and not the tail. All right? Stop waiting on somebody to hand you some money to do what you need to be doing in your own community. The community I grew up in was a black community, New Hallville. It's one of the, now it's one of the poorest and most violent uh, communities in the state of Connecticut. It's the second most outside of uh, the north end of Hartford. But I say all this because it's, we as men, and I, I don't mean to be a sexist, but we as men of color, get out on them corners. There's, this, there's a philosophy called occupying the space. Just as the drug dealer occupies the space to set up shop, occupy the space to plant flowers, occupy the space to clean it. Bishops, reverend. Get your, get your people out there. Do what Matthew 28 chapter says. Go ye in the highways and byways. Right? Compelling and baptizing in my name. Okay? Get that church out of the four consecrated walls. Put that youth choir that wants to sing. Put them on the corner. You ain't got to have a mic system. In segregation, we were, we policed our own. In segregation, we took care of ourselves and we empowered one another. In integration, we lost that autonomy, and we became dependent and waiting for people to assist us. I'm not going to ask you to assist me where I live. I'm going to make the difference where I live. If I've got to do it by myself, I'm going to start by myself. But remember this, just like any boat or wake uh, canoe that goes down the water, it creates a wake. And in that wake, everything gets caught up and sucked up in it. We, as in the communities of black and brown, we have to stop waiting for grants. We have to stop waiting for hands out. We've got to take collective action, and we've got to move ourselves. Like that says, what, I don't care what organization it is, uh, whether it's the sisterhood, whether it's survivors of homicide, put those people out there, and let's take care of them spaces. We can engage those young brothers that are trapping. Yo, bro, um, how you doing? You see that game last night? You see the Mets? You see the Yankees? Guess what, bro? You can't sell that poison on this corner. Yeah, bro. 
Right? It's about the relationships. When I speak to that brother, that brother knows me, and he knows I'm not looking to harm him, but he knows that I'm looking out for the betterment of my community. Mm -hmm. That's where we've got to move. Uh, it's, we are past the time, as I said. We are in a state of crisis. And if you have never been in the emergency room and had your loved one have the doctors walk out of there and tell your sister or tell your mother or your auntie that their nephew or their daughter is gone, and they hear that wailing cry, you have an experience like, and once you've heard it, you'll never want to hear it again. So make a difference so somebody's mother does not have to hear it again. Hmm. We have to be the Calvary. We have to stop waiting on dollars. We have to stop waiting on handouts. We have to be the ones to hold accountability and formal social controls that we were speaking about earlier this morning. We have to go back to that. Our brothers from Gary, Indiana, little Sergeant Titus. Okay, man. Uh, hey, man, let me talk to you. It's all about relation building. Sergeant Titus might, be, might not be the person to respond, but he be, might be able to put me on to Lieutenant Carl Jacobson. And Carl will say, hey, call me. Teaching all people that you have more power from behind the curtain. Peeking from behind that curtain. Yeah, that boy's out there again. He got on that red shirt, white sleeves. He driving such and such car. He got red sneakers. He got a 38 over in the, in the, in the gutter. Mm. <laughs> right? Yeah. You want to leave your name? Quick! Right. So I, I want to, and Don, Don has been holding the mic, and then if you have, are there, if there are questions, are there questions, any? If not, we'll just keep it, keep it funky up on stage. Donna, go ahead, get, just, get in on I this. I just wanted to say, I, I get what everybody is saying, I, even from yesterday, but from a mother's point of view, I'm a single mother. I felt like I felt my son because his father wasn't in his life. Mm. I left him. I'm the type of woman, I'm not going to take any abuse. So I reloaded, reloaded, relocated back to Chicago. We, majority of my friends are single mothers. I couldn't teach my son how to be a man. I don't know what it is to grow up without a father. My mother and father, they still together, been married 58 years. That was his grandfather, that wasn't his father. He had his uncles. He didn't have a father. So I worked, sent my child to a private school during the daytime. So when he left home, when he left out that house, I didn't know what he was doing. I knew some of his friends. When I heard your son, not my son, I remember taking my son. He was 14 years old. I took him to the police station. And I said, you raise him. I said, talk to him. I said, because I don't want you coming knocking on my door saying, where the hell was I at when I'm trying to ask for help? I left. Police brought him back. He said, ma'am, you cannot leave him. <laughs> I, I, I took him Grand and Central. I knew he, he, I, knew I couldn't, do, couldn't have done that, but I did it anyway. But I say this to say, we cannot raise a man. In our neighborhoods, we don't know half our neighbors. They call me 5-0. I don't care because they know. They say, you F with them people. Them are my people. Y'all my people too. Any, my girlfriend called me, Donna, you need to talk to Tay. Tay is her son. I called Tay. Hey, Ma, what's up? What's going on? Your mama said I need to talk to you. No, nah, Ma, she tripping. Wait a minute. Your mama called me, said you being disrespectful. So you're going to give me more respect than you give your mama? We need these fathers to stand up. We need male. We need role models. We can't do it. So, um, <laughs> Thank you so for you sharing. You said something that I can't let go by. You did not fail. If failure belongs to anybody, it belongs to what this brother was just talking about. That's us men who could have been more out there in the streets. And I'm not taking away anything from men who have been and men who are. I'm just saying it should be more of us. And I cannot allow you to lead this panel thinking that you failed your son. Thank you. I'm sorry. No, 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 this, this is what it's about, bro. I know we had a question. I had a question for uh, Mayor. You mentioned uh, Transpole, the bus stations, and the police department as resources. How did you build that? It was not easy. It was not easy. 
And, and let me also say in terms of the funding, one of the most difficult problems I had was controlling my own city staff in community services, trying to get them to change the regulations that were a roadblock to the kinds of funding. First, anybody who's part of the neighborhood resource teams does not go out there until they've had six months of training. They have to have training in implicit bias. They have to understand the training that comes through the uh, Government Alliance on Race and Equity, uh, GARE. People ought to look that up. It's one of the best uh, resources for government to uh, educate all public employees at all levels about race, about equity, and then they're put into situations. And, and uh, like I said, it takes six months. They are still part of their own departments. We want them as being part of their own departments. We don't want to pull them out of the library or out of the police department or, or, or out of the, the, the metro service. And so they're trained in terms of bias, race, and equity, but they are also trained not to run the community. And we had some interesting examples. I'll give you one. We had a situation where the grocery closed and a whole area of the community was left without access to food. And so one of our best team members uh, organized getting a van and organized uh, a situation where some of the moms would stay with all the kids, the others would go shopping, and then they'd switch reverses, all this. And I said, no, you made a mistake. You don't set that up. The mothers do. The other thing that was critical about the neighborhood resource teams is that they pulled together all the assets of the community. If you're familiar with the work of John McKnight at Northwestern University, who was uh, a colleague even earlier on with Saul Linsky, uh, it's the whole concept of asset building. You look at everyone in the community and you say, who and what is their role as an asset? It's property owners, it is businesses, it is the faith-based community, it is your neighbor. And so that's what the neighborhood resource teams do. They connect with the leaders of the neighborhood and then they become that resource. One of the most beneficial things that happened is we had a very isolated neighborhood that had no bus service. And if I'd had my ways nobody be living there. I mean, it was just so isolated. No food, no transportation, no recreation, but somebody had a few bucks and a developer came along and we had to live with it. So there were a whole group of teenagers there. They either caught the bus home after school or they had no way of getting home. Well, with some counselors at school, these teens at the high school got together, they went to the city, to Madison Metro that operates our buses, they put together a budget to get bus service, not just for themselves, but for their whole neighborhood. $400,000 to add that service to their neighborhood and it went through. The neighborhood resource team did not design it, did not run it. What they did was they were a resource to the teens to connect them to the bus people, to the finance people, so that they could learn how to structure a transportation budget. So that's, that's what goes through with it. So we've got about eight sections of the city with about a dozen members of these staffs, and they meet by themselves, they meet with the neighborhoods, and they've got a, I don't know how the new mayor's doing it, but I had a way that, the, all right, city budget, all budget requests, have to come through your department head. Parks, housing, whatever. There was one exception, neighborhood resource teams. They could send it directly to me and then that would get special consideration for funding. But uh, it's not easy. You've got a lot of well-intentioned people who don't know their own biases, they don't know their own innate prejudices and you gotta work with that. But the one thing they've got is they've got a desire to, to, to do better. So uh, the neighborhood resource teams have been around for a number of years. Um, and, and 
they did not contribute directly to the significant reduction that we saw in the homicides. But I believe that without them, we wouldn't have seen the work of the Focused Interruption Coalition, our community safety initiative, being as successful. So that's an interesting point. We had a, a, a street outreach working session in South Bend a, a few months ago. And this question came up in doing this work and doing this community anti-violence work, and we talk about the broader field of emerging science and practice of violence prevention, there's sometimes is this tension between violence prevention in terms of reducing the homicides and the shootings, but also building the community, right? How do you see your work? How do you negotiate that tension? How do you, how do you grapple with that? And anyone feel free to, to jump in as, as well. It's all about empowering the community. It's all about building the community. No one, when a brother or a sister shows you that they got an attitude because you are trying to build your community, then guess what? That person has become my enemy because you, we are not in it for the same thing. At the end of the day, we should all talk about empowering our community. We should all talk about, yes, we want less policing. Well, if we want less policing, then we got to step we have to elevate those non-traditional leaders. There are a number of non-traditional leaders in our community, and they do not deal with the normal structures because of it, the politics, the money. You got that grant last time, I didn't get it. Oh, that, that brother's shicey, that sister's uh, shady. We, we should all be working toward the same common goal. And if you're not about bringing peace, stability, economic development, empowerment to my community, then what are you? Charlatan, pretender, and I can't say this enough, it's imperative on those of us who live in the community. I said, my community, I'm not going nowhere. I'll tell people where I live at, that's where I'm gonna die at. But this is my hood. And just a little bit of intervention. So you see what a few people can do Imagine if you multiply that and you have 10, 20, 30, the difference we can make in our communities. It should never be any tension about elevating our communities and bringing peace. And for me, I agree with that in the sense that I believe that oftentimes the connection is not properly made. That when you're talking about police and responding to violence, it should be the same kind of talk that suggests community and how you build it up. Until those works are seen as together, then it's never going to work. Dig, that, dig into that a little bit more. So if you build your community up, you will lessen their need to come in to respond to violence. Oftentimes, though, it's seen from a community sense but it's not necessarily all the time seen from a police sense. And until those conversations begin to, my whole job for being the police in this area, when I'm responding to violence, I'm doing that for you, the community. Why? Because it is a way to help build your community up. Something has to be done, this brother just mentioned, if he's going out there constantly talking to someone about his community and what they need not do in perpetrating violence or whatever, and they're not responding to him, he said, that person becomes my enemy because they're not looking out for the well-being of the neighborhood. So then, but what has to happen to that person? Now, if we have officers who understand his point and say, you know what? I'm not here just to arrest someone. I'm here to help you deal with someone that's not listening to your message on upbuilding a community and something's got to happen to at least try to get him to hear you out. And if he's not going to hear you out, then we have to do what we have to do. But until those stories go together and until we see it all as work to upbuild the community and not separate work, like when you mentioned it, you talked about and it's a reality. So I'm not saying anything about you. I'm saying it's a reality. We see those as two separate works, policing against violence, community upbuilding. And I'm saying it's the same work. It's on the same continuum. 
And that may go with the redefining again that I do so often <laughs> in the sense of, you know, what I'm talking about. But that's what I mean. It's the same work. In my one body, if I have a cold, no, I, I don't go and examine somebody else, but I got to do something with that germ that's in my body. <laughs> I got to get it out. <laughs> So then do you see the work that you're doing as part of this larger field that David spoke of yesterday, this, this, this practice of violence prevention, or is it, is it a practice of community building, or to redefine it, is it a practice of both and the same? It's a, my whole span is that it is a practice of community upbuilding that involves different methods. A part of that method is policing violence. A part of that method is where is our faith base? A part of that method is what happens to our economic. A part of that is our local government. All of us need to see ourselves as a part of a bigger goal. And that's the problem. All of our parts, we have an individual goal for that part. And that should not, that's not how community can exist. Community can exist if all parts of it, my body can exist and I'm going a little Bible here, so y'all, I'm sorry about that. But my, my, body can't, my body can't exist. If my hands got its own agenda, and my foot's got its own agenda, and my brain's got its own agenda, my body can't exist as a whole. Am I right? right. All right, so I mean, this eye got its own agenda. It won't look this way. This one got its own agenda. It won't look that way. There's a reason why everything is the function. And I think we all have to get to the place where Mr. Mayor is talking about, to the place where Mrs. Stacy is talking about, where mom is talking about. All of it goes in the pot on how are we going to get Pookie and Ray Ray mm. to either straighten up or we have to trust that our policing agencies are not going to abuse Pookie and Ray Ray because we don't want them abused. We just need them, maybe they need to sit somewhere else for a while until they get it. <laughs> mm -hmm. But we need to all see that as one common goal and that's what community is about. Wow. So to give a, a quick plug, uh, one of the concurrent panels going on right now, it's uh, Mike McLivey with Giffords. They put out a report on the work that Oakland has done. And Oakland looked at different systematic areas for their uh, support and what we would call support and outreach, you know, uh, trauma, uh, education and uh, economics, um, different different areas. So it's 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 online in case anyone. Um, I, I know some people came looking for some specific tools. Uh, check out the report on uh, Oakland, uh, done by Giffords. I know we're coming close to time. Maybe if we can get kind of a lightning round. What uh, in your innovation, or maybe it's not an innovation. What strategy? What gem? What nugget? Not necessarily an inspirational nugget, because although that's great. But what tool? can people walk away from? Uh, can each one of you give someone at least just one tool that they can leave here with, that they can say, okay, I'm going back to my community with, with this thing from this panel? Well, I just wanted to leave with one more thought that's been part of our structure. Uh, someone earlier today talked about Maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs. We found that there are five critical areas that are essential for a family, whether it's one person or it's ten. And those are housing, which is first. Children who aren't housed don't learn. Parents who don't have housing cannot earn a living and take care of their families. Transportation, quality child care, there's the education job training component, and there is health care. And health care includes behavioral health, and it includes food, nutrition, hungry children do not learn. Those five are essential. The kids we're working with, when I say kids, I'm talking under the age of 40, they may not be ready the moment we embrace them with our community initiatives. Someone said it earlier today, they may not be ready for the job, they may not be ready to participate constructively in the community. But those five elements are absolutely critical if we are going to have strong, healthy families. Gotcha. Anyone else, 60 seconds or less? Build relationships. 
Walk out of here today with the commitment that you're going back to your communities and you're going to create a greater network of relationships, whether it's with your power structure, with the philanthropic, whether it's your businesses, whether it's your social services. I might be a poor man, but when I know how to pick up a phone or send an email chain saying I need X, Y, Z, and I send it to 20 people, if you've got a credible name, guess what? You're going to get those resources. But it's all about relationships. The more relationships you have, the better off you are. And be, be not afraid to step out of your comfort zone and build relationships with those that you normally would not. My counterpart here is Lieutenant Carl Jacobson. The key thing that makes him uh, successful is that he steps out of the normal traditional police role, takes young men to lunch, buys X, Y, and Z, but speaks to them and says, listen, if I've, if I've got to lock you up, then I failed. Come on, baby. No, you don't need to go to jail. You don't need to sit and get that butt tenderized before things, you get that epiphany in your mind that I need to do X, Y, and Z to be successful. Walk out of here and ex expand your relationships. All right, now we're working for 30 seconds or less. <laughs> <laughs> Think it, strategize it, find it, do it. Don't give up on Pokey and Ray Ray, because they're not all bad. They just need a hug and need someone to say they love you. So don't give up on them. So it sounds like, if I'm hearing everyone, key takeaways are building relationships, meeting the basic needs, strategize, and don't give up. Does that sound like what people yeah, are saying? A, yeah. And uh, just to, if I can push back a little bit on my boss, David Kennedy, when he opened up and said, there are things that we know now that we did not know before. But it sounds like the power of community action is that you already know what works. And it's that, it's that love. It's that one person to person connection. It's putting, as Garland Scott said, putting the neighbor back in the hood. And that is the thing that sounds like which drives down the violence. Is that, does that sound about accurate? Now, before I wrap, I just got to say, I'm going to have a, a bone to pick with Stacey Spell because he, she mentioned the fraternities. He knows I'm an alpha. And uh, that's all right, though. But he's right. But he's right. But he's right. He has a point. He has a point. And, um, and when y'all go back and go, go, not only just go back to your communities, but when y'all go back and look at this tape that's going to be online, part of what you heard here today isn't just about concrete uh, solutions to uh, preventing violence in community building. But I want you to also know, especially on this, this Juneteenth holiday, that what you have heard is really the uh, retelling or, or it is the evocation of the spectrum of black social thought in the Western Hemisphere, you know, between the, the Garveyites, right? You even got, you got, you know, Patricia Hill Collins, you know, who she, who she is, look her up. You got, you got the different perspectives from the community right here on the stage. And that, I would also say, is the power of community action. So please join me in thanking our panelists for their time and their expertise. Thank you so much, everybody. Can I get a picture of you? Yeah. <laughs> this is my brother and my sister. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very good to meet you. Nice to meet you. Like you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh wow. I'm, I'm gonna see if I you really pointed that out to me. I said maybe that's